Almighty God, we do thank you once again for your word. We bless your name, Lord, because here we are today once again. Because you want to take us to the promised land in glory. Are you showing us the express way, the highway? We pray, Lord, as you show us the way, we'll take the way that leads home to glory in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, our hearts will not refuse. Our hearts will not reject. But this way you place before us will follow through until the end of our journey in jesus name speak to every heart now to the young to the old to the men to the women to the members to the invitees everyone lord will hear your word in jesus name and fulfill your will in the world in our lives in jesus name we pray Thank you very much. We can sit down. We come to this important subject. Heavenly citizenship. What the subject that is. And what revelation we have in the word of God. That the ultimate goal. And you see why Christ came. And you see even for the creation of man. Is that God eventually will be able to have a people that will live with Him and live with Him forever? And we need to know and understand and remember that however long we spend on earth, become a Methuselah, live more than 900 years here on earth. 900 years, a thousand years is nothing in comparison with a million years, a trillion years, in comparison with millions and millions of years without end. And if there's anything we ought to be thinking about, if there's anything we ought to be reading about, anything we ought to be praying about without ceasing, it is that so that we become the citizens of heaven everything we do on earth is a preparation for glory and the reason why the lord christ came is to prepare us and take us or bring us to glory hebrews chapter 2 hebrews chapter 2 reading from verse 10 for it became him for it behooved him, for it befitted him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Do you see why Christ came? It's so that eventually it will take many sons to glory many people to glory and the people of god understood that they knew that's the reason why christ came and it was in their heart that they will be citizens of heaven hebrews chapter 11 verse 10 hebrews 11 verse 10 for he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. They had cities to live on earth, but they knew that that was earthly, temporal, only of this world. And because of that, their hearts were longing. Their hearts were desirous. And they were looking ahead to the time they will see the Lord and live and dwell with the Lord in eternity. They were rich on us, some of them, but they looked for a city up in glory, up on high. They were popular on earth, but even with the popularity, they said that's not enough. The popularity is going to be for a few years. They still look for a city. 
there are many people around them sons daughters neighbors relatives but they said that's not enough they still look for a city and they had a lot of investment here in the world but they knew whatever investment they had whatever possession they had whatever inheritance they had they said that's not enough but they still look for a city which has foundation whose builder and maker is god some of them had power and authority some of them had possessions and they had some kind of servants they could control some of them hundreds thousands of servants but he said all that will come to an end one day because of that they were looking for a city which has foundations whose builder and maker is god verse 13 these all died in faith not having received the promises but having seen them afar off they were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that there were strangers and pilgrims on the earth and he said as strangers and pilgrims you don't say to you as if this is your final home as if this is your eternal home as if you're going to be here forever and ever they said they were just strangers and you are a stranger here don't you know that they're just a pilgrim here moving on here from where you were and you're going on to the promised land verse 14 for they that say such things they clear plainly that they seek a country and truly if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out they might have had opportunity to have returned but now they desire a better country heaven is a better place more glorious place than anywhere you could be here in the world everybody knew that christ knew that that's why i said i'm going to prepare a place for you now they desire a better country that is an heavenly heavenly country wherefore god is not ashamed to be called their god for he has prepared for them a city he has prepared the city and is going to take only prepared people there i pray that you and i will be prepared and ready in jesus name first john chapter 3 first john chapter 3 verse 1 be, behold what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of god therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not it's telling us that the world does not know us why should the world know us after all this is not our home we have a heavenly home we're known in our home we're known in heaven we're not known in the world here beloved verse 2 now are we the sons of god and it does not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when he shall appear we shall see him you will see him for we shall see him and we shall see him as he is and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure every man that has this hope in him purifies himself i'm sure you would have met religious people church going people that don't care about purity they don't purify themselves all they think about is going to church they don't purify themselves they don't have the hope of heaven all they think about is being religious they don't purify themselves all they think about is 
the opinions of people about them and once people respect them honor them exalt them flatter them that's enough for them that's what they're looking for and because of that if they can have the praise of men without purity if they can have the exaltation of men without being pure if they can have the exaltation of men and they can have all these accolades and applause they give unto them without being pure all they want is just that applause but those who have the hope of heaven those who want to go to heaven and those who want to live in a place of glory forever and ever everyone every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure that shows the kind of person we are if whatever you have got now a place in the world position in the world a place in the church position in the church a name in the world a name in the church if that's all you need and you've got it you'll not think it's necessary to purify yourself you'll say what am i purifying myself for i have what i have always wanted but here it says the people that have the hope of glory the hope of heaven and they want to spend eternity in heaven every man without exception because only the pure will reach there only the holy will reach there only the righteous will reach there every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure heavenly citizenship will be there in jesus name give me a good good amen i'm dividing the message to three parts number one passion and pursuit of the heavenly city passion and pursuit of the heavenly city number two the promise and preparation for the heavenly country promise and preparation for the heavenly country number three purity and perseverance you need to persevere and deal till the very end hold on to the very end maintain the same commitment the same consecration the same devotion and the same heart desire until the very end purity and perseverance of heavenly citizens number one passion and pursuit of the heavenly city for the heavenly city we're looking at psalm 27 psalm 27 we're looking at verse 4 one thing have i desired of the lord is the psalm of david the man had a name the man had position the man had some honor the man had some servant soldiers the man had some wealth he had riches he had prosperity he had wife he had children he had houses he had palace but then you said one thing have i desired of the lord that and that will i seek after he said, beyond and above, everything I have got, there's one thing I'm seeking after. There's one thing I'm pursuing. There's one thing I'm passionate about. One thing have I desired of the Lord. You see, that's what makes the Christian life what it ought to be. Once you are derailed, once you are distracted, and you put another thing, beyond this one thing this desire to get to heaven maybe riches maybe having a husband maybe having a wife maybe having children maybe have a job maybe having a kind of title in the denomination becoming a reverend a bishop 
an archbishop, a priest, a father. Once you put any other sin beyond the desire of getting to heaven, it's going to affect your faithfulness and obedience to the world. You'll not be conscious of who you are, where you are, what you're doing. But David said, with all I have got, one sin have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 19, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 19 If in this life only we have hope in Christ we are of all men most miserable Are there not people that their Christianity is only for this life are there not people that pray only for things of this life? Are there not people that are very, very religious and sanctimonious only because of the things of this life? Look at the millions of people in this our country, in this continent of Africa, that rush to a place of worship one day or the other and ask, why do they go there? Why do they rush there? And look at the thousands of people that come to our church. And you need to ask the question, what do they come? What are you looking for? Is it only for the things of this world? And then when you pray, and you're praying for this, or the things of this world, how do you pray so passionately and so fervently when it comes to thinking and preaching and hearing and preparing for heaven and praying for heaven? How do you pray? If only if in this world in this life only you have hope in christ you'll be of all men the most miserable because the lord himself said in mark chapter 8 mark chapter 8 reading from verse 36 for what shall he profit a man if he shall gain the whole world what will you do to gain something in this world? Maybe you want to gain money. What do you do to gain money? Maybe you want to gain promotion in your place of work. What do you do to gain promotion in the place of work? Maybe you want to have a certificate. After all, that certificate is going to be useless the day you die. When you are buried. The certificates are not going to be buried with you. Even if they are buried with you, what's the use? What's the value? What do you do to get a certificate? Maybe some people, all they want is getting a why. What do you do to get a why? You know, people will do anything to get a why. But the day you die, that wife will not be buried with you. What do you do to get a husband? anything anything the people that forget their souls they forget eternity they forget holiness without which no man shall see the lord they will do anything and the word of god is saying what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world come back to the church here what do you do to gain the position of a pastor the privilege of a worker and to hold your place so that nobody will ever be able to remove you or discipline you. What do you do? To keep the place of being a worker in the church. But how useful is that? What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man gain give in exchange for his soul. If there's anything we ought to seek, if there's anything we ought to run after, if there's anything we ought to pursue, it should be that we're ready and prepared for heaven. Paul the Apostle knew that. That's why his passion, his pursuit 
as we get there eventually. In Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. I'm reading there from verse 21. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ. It says, I wake up in the morning, I'm thinking, how can I follow Christ more intimately today? How can I speak like Christ, talk like Christ, act like Christ, think like Christ, behave like Christ, eat like Christ, and interact like Christ, love like Christ? How can I do something today just to be more intimate with Christ? For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. This was not a man afraid of death. Uh, if you know religious people, in fact, the reason why many, many people go to churches or run to churches, especially churches where they pray and pray and pray, Lord. They are praying about heaven. They are praying so that you will extend your place and your life here on earth so that they will not die, so enemies will not catch them, so sickness will not kill them. What does it matter? If you live long on earth, you live in hell, you live in wealth, but there's no salvation. For me to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I what not, I know not. For I mean it's strange betwixt two. I mean a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. That's the passion. Of a real apostle. Show me an apostle today. Many people that parade themselves. I'm apostle, I'm apostle, I'm apostle. Do they have this passion to go to heaven? This desire to go to heaven? Or is it just a title? Here yeah, it says, I mean it's strange. Betwixt you. It's like there is kind of conflict here within me. I have a desire to depart. And to be with Christ, which is far better. In verse 24, nevertheless to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. I'm sure you know some people that they, they don't understand the scriptures. They don't understand the pursuit and the passion of a believer. And then sometimes, you know, they want to kind of deceive you with their dreams and their visions. And they say, you know, come to our church because our prophet said, you know, there is a relative. And then as he described it, I know he was describing you. And he said that that relative is going to die. And if he doesn't come, leave his church and come to our church and we'll pray for him and anoint him with oil and give him deliverance, he will die. You know, that's the method they use for the people who don't know that death is glory. Like going home, going to heaven, there's nothing bad in going to heaven. And the apostle said, I want you to go. I want you to go, but I'm going to stay for some time to minister unto you. Don't allow anybody to threaten you. But that thing they call death, death, death. They saw a vision, they had a dream, and somebody said, and then somebody comes to you and he says, Are you so and so? Yes, I am. Huh. Be very careful. Don't uh, go to the retreat. Don't go to a crusade. Don't go anywhere. There's some people waiting for you there. They're going to kill you. You know, this uh, kind of thing that they use in the world right now. And they use that because you don't know. They know you don't understand that you have to have the passion and the desire of going to heaven. Jesus is there. Why would he not be there? In Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I'm reading there from verse 10. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings. Being made conformable unto his death. Then he says, If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. That was his passion. That was his pursuit. A real child of God. That ought to be your passion. He says, that I may know him. And then he says, if I may, if I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I'd already attained. Either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of, of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have 
have apprehended. But this one thing I do. He had a passion. He had a pursuit. He had a desire. And he wouldn't allow anything to discourage him or to turn him around. And if you're a real child of God, that ought to be your heart. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but who receiveth the prize, so run that she may obtain. It says there is a prize, there is an inheritance, there is a reward, and it's reserved for you in glory in heaven. And it says, so she so run the race. So live the life that you'll win that prize eventually. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Every man, every woman, every member of the body of Christ, every member of the living church, striving for the mastery, wanting to reach the goal, is temperate and controlled in everything. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. But we, an incorruptible, I therefore so run. Not as uncertainly, so fight I. Not as one that beateth the air. But I do what? But I do what? But I do what? I keep under my body. I beat it to submission. I'm watching my body. Your eyes, keep that under control. Your ears, keep that under control. Your hands, keep that under control. Your voice, keep that under control. Your feet, where you go, keep that under control. Your body, what you do with that body, keep that under control. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. You know what the, Paul the Apostle said? Paul the Apostle said, I may bring other men and women to, under subjection. That doesn't get me to heaven. I can bring even the Gentiles, Gentile nations, bring them under subjection. That doesn't get me to heaven. How many soldiers, how many captains of armies, bring a whole nation to subjection that doesn't make them to get to heaven bringing other people to subjection he said the only thing that gets me to heaven is when i stop trying to put other people other people on a subjection on a control you know there are people all they want is to control other people make other people submit make other people keep them under subjection and he says that means nothing in eternity. You could keep every man in the world under subjection. You could keep everybody around you under subjection. Trample over them. Walk over them. You'll treat them. And so put pressure on them that they'll be like, you know, trembling anytime they see you. I say, aha, uh -huh, that's good. I'm now on top. I put them under subjection. But do you know the thing that gets you to heaven? It's not putting any other person under subjection. Putting members of the church under subjection. Putting workers under subjection. Being overbearing. In control. Making sure that everybody bends the knee. When you come around. Putting others in subjection doesn't get you anywhere. But when you say, uh -huh, I'm going to concentrate on the really important thing to get to heaven. My passion. My pursuit. My desire is to get to that finishing point of the race. And because of that, I want to be wise. I want to keep myself, my body, my mind. My life under control, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that 
by any means when I have done what? Can I hear you? I have done what? I have preached to others. I have given counsel to others. I have ministered to others. I myself should be what? A castaway. A castaway. If somebody does not put his mind under control, his tongue under control, his life under control, preaching doesn't take us to heaven. Teaching others that will not take us to heaven by itself. Counseling others that will not take us to heaven by itself. Leading other people that will not take us to heaven by itself. Ministering to other people that doesn't take us to heaven by itself. Lest that after I have preached unto others, I myself be cast away. And Paul the Apostle said, I don't want to be cast away. You know there are people that say once they are saved, they are forever saved. It doesn't matter what they do. Paul the apostle said, no, no, I'm a preacher. I'm an apostle, a teacher, a prophet, an evangelist, and then a pastor. All the same, I put my body under control. Put it under subjection. Lest after I preach to others, I myself will become a castaway. You see, those people, they had the desire to get to heaven. And they knew that whatever they were doing, it was for the moment. And that must be a relation to the desire getting to heaven. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm reading verse 12 all through to verse 14. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with some blood, suffered without the gate. Let us Go forth therefore unto him without the camp. It says, therefore, since Christ has paid the whole price for salvation, full salvation, for sanctification, entire sanctification, there's nothing to be done which has not been done for salvation. Nothing still to be done which has not been done. It says, therefore now, there's one thing to do. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. I pray you'll be there in Jesus' name. Point number two, the promise and the preparation. For the heavenly country promise and preparation for the heavenly country we're looking at john chapter 14 john chapter 14 verse 1 let not your heart be troubled you believe in god believe also in me in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Will Jesus deceive us? Will Jesus tell a lie? If there were no heaven, why will he say, I go to prepare a place for you? If there were no heaven, where did Elijah go when the chariots of fire came from on high and took him up? If there were no heaven, where was Moses, where was Elijah? Before the day and before the Mount of Transfiguration, when they appeared to Jesus and were talking with him. If there were no heaven, where did Jesus go when the disciples were looking at him? And then he was taken up, taken up to heaven, and they saw him. And the angels came and said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into the sky? This same Jesus, that you have seen going up into heaven, will come in like manner. There is heaven. I said there is heaven. 
in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so i would have told you i go to prepare a place for you and if i go and prepare a place for you i will come again and receive you unto myself that where i am where i am where is jesus now where is jesus today where has jesus been since he went in heaven where i am there ye may be also that's a promise that's a promise i pray that that promise will be fulfilled in your life in jesus name first peter chapter one first peter chapter one verse three blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again born again begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you that's a promise it's reserved an inheritance for us what do we do then verse 14 as obedient children not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance but as he which has called you is holy so be ye holy how in all manner of conversation because it is written be ye holy for i am holy verse 22 seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned unpretending love of the brethren see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently being born again that's very important born again born again born again to be able to get to heaven born again not of corruptible seed but of being corruptible by the word of god which liveth and abideth forever for all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man is the, as the flower of grass the grass withereth the flower thereof fadeth away all the glory of man all the things you honor men for it's like flower it's going to fade away but the word of the lord endureth forever and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you that tells us then the promise of heaven and jesus said in chapter 17 of john john chapter 17 reading from verse 24 john 17 verse 24 it tells us father i will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where i am you see the desire of christ our lord our savior i will i desire those who have given unto me that they'll be with me where i am for thou love, and then it says in verse 24, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovedst me before the foundation of the world. Luke chapter 13. The promise of the heavenly country. And then the preparation for that heavenly country. Luke chapter 13 i'm reading from verse 23 luke chapter 13 verse 23 then said one unto him lord are there few that be saved are there few that will get to heaven have you noticed that people are always interested in other people what will this other man do where will this other man live they're not concerned about themselves but about other people are there few that will be saved 
and he said unto them strive to enter in at the straight gate so think about yourself think about your future think about your destiny and think about where you in particular where you will spend eternity don't think about other people talking about other people you know this world is like you know they don't care about themselves much but they care about other people it's like are there a few people that will be rich what's that to you what you want is what you should go for are there people that will be healed from sicknesses what's that to you just for yourself are there people that will be educated not for yourself just think about yourself are there people that will be saved that will get to heaven he said unto them think about yourself and strive to enter in at the straight gate for many I say unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able when once the master of the house is risen up and are shut to the door and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door saying Lord Lord open unto us and ye shall answer and say unto you I know you not whence ye are many people what will be their response when the Lord says I don't know you where you are coming from verse 26 then shall ye begin to say we have eaten and drunk in thy presence where was that that was at their retreat they had 5,000 there not counting the men the women and the children and he says sit down and he sat down and he fed them and the only ate the physical food they didn't take the spiritual food and they didn't take the food that would make them to live and live with the glory of God in their lives until they got to eternity and so they began to say We've eaten in your presence. You were there, we were there. And thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not. When ye are, depart from me. Tell me the rest. Tell me the rest. Say that again. All ye, all, all, all. No exception, all, all. All ye workers of iniquity. God is no respecter of persons. Coming to church, if you see a worker of iniquity, a worker of evil, a worker in sinning, developing and growing in sinning, in evil, all ye workers of iniquity. Then, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out, thrown out, cast out. And they shall come from the east, and from the west, and from the north, and from the south, and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are last which shall be forced and there are forced which shall be tell me last last what does that mean you know the new converts how they are eager to serve the lord you know the new converts how they are passionate in serving the lord you know the new converts how they are on fire for the lord you know the new converts how they obey the lord promptly and then those are the last that shall be forced. You know the old timers. You know the people that got saved many, many years ago. And you know how cold they are. And you know how slow they are. And you know how they say, I knew that before. No pastor is going to jerk me up and stir me up and push me up and lead me on. I'm going to take my time. And when I want is when I will do it. The first that shall be last. I pray that the fire of God will burn in your soul in Jesus' name. And you will not be among the first that shall be last. You can, you can be the first and can remain the first. At least Enoch remained the first. 
and Elijah, he remains the first. And Peter and Paul and John, they remain in the front line until they died. We'll remain on the front line till we die in Jesus' name. That's what it's going to take for us. To, now we need to make preparation, preparation, preparation. We're looking at Psalm 15 verse 1. Psalm 15. We're reading from verse 1. The preparation we're making for that heavenly country. Psalm 15 verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in the tabernacle? Who shall dwell in the holy hill? He that walketh uprightly, that walketh righteousness, that speaketh the truth in his heart. Do you know how many people have the truth in their heart, but they see another thing with their tongue? Do you know how many people know the exact thing, the absolute truth in their heart, but they see another thing with their tongue? But to get to heaven, and to live in heaven forever it takes you forgetting whatever it is if i tell the truth what's the consequence it takes you forgetting the consequence of telling the truth and just go ahead and tell the truth he that walketh uprightly he that walketh righteousness he that speaketh the truth in his heart he that backbiteth not with his tongue that's how to get to heaven. What price are you willing to pay to get to heaven? What are you willing to do to get to heaven? If backbiting has become the sweet thing that you do every day, talking about your leaders, about your overseers no more preaching no more evangelism no more soul winning all you have to talk about is just talk about that overseer talk about his why spread information about their children that's now your full time business Backbiting and to get to heaven, are you willing to pay that price of just allowing other people to mind their business and you mind your own business and live your own life and say, I'm not interested in any information, information about this, about that, about brother, about sister, about that child, about their children, about their wife, about their husband. I'm not interested. All I want is to get to heaven. That's my push. That's my passion. That's my pursuit. And all this gossip here and there, count me out of that. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor. Nor doeth evil to his neighbor. You know the people of the world, before you hurt them, they try to hurt you first. You have not even hurt them. You have not done anything against them. But they are suspecting should in case he may have the intention to hurt me let me hurt him first and paralyze him let me hurt him first and destroy him let me hurt him first and then stop his intention a believer doesn't do that a believer will turn the other cheek a believer will say what does it matter maybe he wants to hurt me who knows let him go ahead and do it that's only in the world the Lord will reward me for that in eternity. But you know the backsliders of today, they want to hurt you before you even make any attempt to do anything against them. And it says over here that he, do, he doesn't do any evil to his neighbor. Taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. In whose eyes a vile person is contained. That vile person may have money. He says, go away with your money. Who needs your money? Dirty money. A vile person is contempt. A person that is immoral, that is evil, bringing gifts unto you. Reject it. That's how to get to heaven. In whose eyes, a vile person is contempt. Condemned and rejected. But he honors them that fear the Lord. He that swear to his own heart 
and changes not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh re reward against the innocent. He that doeth this sin shall never be moved. That's how to get to heaven. Psalm 24. Psalm 24 verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? Then he tells us very clearly in verse 4. He that has clean hands. He that has clean hands. He that has clean hands. Your hands are not sticky. To take the money that doesn't belong to you. Either in the office or in the community. The virus and the papers of the office. Your hands are not sticky to take them without permission. And of course, you don't touch your maid. Or you don't touch and defile your daughter. If you're going to get to heaven, your hands are clean. And you don't touch another man's wife. Don't allow the sin they call the flesh to drag you to hell. One day in hell, you'll forget all the pleasure you ever had with another man's wife. Let your hands be clean. Don't allow lost immorality. Don't allow all those pleasures of the flesh. Touching other people's wives, defiling other people's wives to take you to hell. What a great price you pay for dishonoring the Lord. It says, He that has clean hands and a pure heart, a holy heart, a new heart, a sanctified heart. Then it says, Who has not lifted up his soul. Unto vanity, not sworn deceitfully. I pray God will get us ready for heaven. I said He'll get us ready for heaven. Have you noticed that kind of that kind of amen? If I said God will get us ready for healing, for deliverance, your amen will take away the roof. But then I say once again, I pray God will get us ready for heaven. You know, in the earlier years, that's what deeper life stood for. That's what we're still standing for. We have always believed in healing, but we put healing behind holiness. We have always believed it's good to be joyful and happy, but we have always put happiness behind holiness, not before. We always made holiness to be number one. If healing comes after, praise the Lord. If happiness comes after, praise the Lord. But healing will come behind. Happiness will come behind. Holiness, I watch word and lifestyle. Holiness, number one. And I pray God will do it for us. Number three now, the purity and the perseverance. The purity and the perseverance. The Lord is telling us that if we're going to get to heaven and thank God he has prepared a place for us, we want to get there. And he's giving us the highway to that promised land. The highway. The highway to that promised land. And he's showing us how we, what we need to do. And how we need to get there. And he tells us, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And if there's anything that ought to be uppermost in your heart, anything that ought to be number one in your life, it is that you'll be born again, so thoroughly born again. That you live the life of a real child of God. So that heaven, you will not miss heaven in Jesus' name. And if that is going to happen, it means then that you exalt 
holiness as number one righteousness as number one purity of heart as number one sanctification as number one because that is what it takes we're looking at first john again chapter three first john chapter three i'm reading to you from verse one first john chapter three verse one here we read behold what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us that we shall be called the sons of god remember those peacemakers those who don't like fighting the church those who do not kind give themselves to kind of stimulating engineering conflict in the house of god those are the sons of god therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not beloved now we the peacemakers we who are born again we who have been washed by the blood of the lamb we are the sons of god and it does not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is and every man how many people and every man how many people and every man how many people every man doesn't matter which church you belong to every man every man every man you know sometimes as i move around some people say i am not of that denomination i'm not of that it doesn't matter if heaven is your goal doesn't matter if heaven is your passion and your pursuit and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself you know sometimes i ask somebody are you sanctified oh he says pastor i'm not a worker i said what do you mean who oh, said i've learned i've heard that it's only when you are a worker they're going to ask you a question when were you saved when were you sanctified and since i'm not a worker am i not allowed to do jaws as i would since somebody is not a worker can't he live a sinful life a licentious life a dirty life an unrighteous life no sanctification is not just for workers it's for anyone and everyone that wants to get to heaven and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure what does that mean to be pure it means to be free from sin verse 5 and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin when he has come into your life and has taken all the sins away all the fornication taken away all the adultery taken away all the hypocrisy taken away when he has taken all your sins away that's purity and then it says whosoever abideth in him sinneth not whosoever sinneth has not seen him neither known him little children let no man deceive you he that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous he that committeth sin tell me tell me I hope you understand that applies to everybody there's nobody that's above the word of god god doesn't say well he is so and so he has a great position even though he commits sin i'm going to kind of not apply that everyone if it's applicable to everybody and if you're going to get to heaven you must be free from sin because don't you remember what we sang heaven is a holy place filled with glory and with grace sin can never enter there all within its gates appear from defilement kept secure sin can never enter there if you hope to dwell at last when our life on earth is past in that home so bright and fair you must 
here be cleansed from sin and have the life of Christ within. Why? Because sin can never enter there. You may live in sin here below. Heaven's grace refused to know. But you cannot enter there. It will stop you at the gate by you forever. Out forevermore. Sin can never enter there. If you clinch unto sin until you die. When you draw your latest breath, you will sink in that despair to the regions of the lost, thus to know. And what a great, awful thing. Just to prove at awful cost that sin can never enter there. Sin can never enter there. Sin can never enter there. So if at the judgment bar, sinful sport, your soul shall mar, you can never enter there. That's the reason the Lord is telling us that what we need to do is to be cleansed from sin. And when you are born again, that is done. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God, tell me. I said to say, by is born of God, was the rest? Ah, you are afraid to say it. He that is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. And he cannot sin. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5, verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. When somebody is born of God, is so conscious of the presence of Christ, so conscious of the power of the Holy Spirit, and is so conscious of the desire to go to heaven, and he says, ah, uh ah, -uh, I cannot do that, I cannot go there, I cannot touch that because I want to get to heaven. And says over here, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. And then in that verse 18, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. And that wicked one toucheth him not. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 3 According as his divine power Has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness He has given us already The possibility of being holy is there He's given us The possibility of being pure and righteous is there He has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness Through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue whereby he are given unto all exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. That's what it takes to become holy. That's what it takes to become righteous. That's what it takes to become a member, a citizen of that heavenly city, heavenly country that it makes us partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lost. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things, he that lacketh saving faith, he that lacketh diligence, he that lacketh virtue, he that lacketh the knowledge of the things of the Lord, he that lacketh temperance, self-control, self 
discipline. He that lacketh patience, perseverance. He that lacketh godliness. He that lacketh brotherly kindness and brotherly charity, love and charity. He that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. And has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Verse 10. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling. Don't worry about others, just yourself. To make your calling an election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. I pray you will not fall. I said you will not fall. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace with how many people? Tell me out loud. Follow peace with all men. John Wesley had a wife that was tough, difficult. Wanted to get that man, preacher of holiness, away from the path of holiness. But John Wesley knew he had married, he had married. What could he do? He kept his experience of holiness. Follow peace with all men. Judas Iscariot was one of the twelve the treasurer of the team. And Jesus knew him. But Jesus never forgot where he was going. Follow peace with all men. The early church had loads of problems from those religious fanatics. What could they do? Follow peace with all men. In your community, around you, there will be many people that will just say, I know his passion. I know his pursuit. I know what he wants to do. He wants to get to heaven. If we can just make him, disorganize him, disorganize her, we'll win and take him to hell with us. Don't fight. Follow peace with all men. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. Follow peace with all men. And, and what? I said and what? And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Was holiness? Honesty without hypocrisy. Are you that honest through and through? Are you honest in the dark? Honest when nobody will discover what you've done? Honest far away? Honest holy nearby? Holiness is honesty without hypocrisy. What's holiness? Obedience without obstinacy. Obedient to the word of God without being obstinate, stiff-necked, rigid. Obedience to the word of gracious obedience. Loving obedience. Obedience to the word of God. That you are very conscious not to become a kind of religious fanatics. Just doing something to do it. You look at the word of God. Then you say, I want to be holy. And holiness means obedience without obstinacy. What's holiness? is love without lust. Holiness is love. You love, and the Bible describes the love for us, not lust, not this kind of erotic and sentimental things between a man and another man's wife, a man and another man's daughter. Love without lust. That's holiness. What's holiness? Holiness is integrity without iniquity. Having integrity 
and you can be counted upon no matter where you are for no reason will you be unjust for no reason will you shift the standard integrity without iniquity you don't want to do anything wrong to gain anything you say whatever it is i will gain by being unrighteous i give it up gain money gain position gain prestige great gain flattery and gain the praise of men what do you want to gain holiness is integrity without iniquity what's holiness holiness is newness without negligence new new heart new life new behavior without negligence because to a new creature that doesn't make you to neglect your duty that doesn't make you to neglect your responsibility holiness is newness of life without negligence was holiness endurance without enmity endurance without enmity you know there are people that endure but they have so much enmity in their heart i will endure their pressure but i hate them that's not holiness i will endure the discipline but i hate the pastor and when he calls me back i will show him i will fight back i will endure the inconvenience but i'm going to use some wisdom and i'm going to torment that man that is giving me that inconvenience that's not holiness i will endure whatever i'm going through but i will never pray for that man or love that man that's not holiness what's holiness endurance without enmity what's holiness self-denial without self-indulgence self-denial without self-indulgence that's what jesus said and he said if anyone follows me let him take up his cross deny himself and follow me he said in another place if a man follows me and he does not take up his cross deny himself bear his cross he cannot be my disciple holiness is self-denial without self-indulgence what's holiness holiness is steadfastness without stubbornness you're not to be steadfast in evil the stubbornness you're not to be steadfast in rebellion the stubbornness you're not to be steadfast in wrong doctrine in false doctrine holiness is steadfastness in good doctrine good behavior good lifestyle holiness steadfastness without stubbornness and that's what the lord said follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord honesty without hypocrisy obedience without obstinacy love without loss integrity without iniquity newness without negligence and endurance without enmity self-denial without self-indulgence steadfastness without stubbornness i pray god will give it to us i said god will give it to us follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Rise up and let us pray.